I had dial-up internet until I relocated into the city at the beginning of 2014. The internet available where I lived in the country was either dial-up or subpar wireless that was only a half step better than the dial-up, or very expensive wireless that apparently was pretty decent but way out of my price range and not even worth it. Before relocating into the city and upgrading my service, my internet was never faster than 3 kilobytes per second. Let me back up here. My family first got internet in 99. Back then dial-up wasn't so outdated, but it wasn't long before dial-up wasn't the norm anymore. Here we have a 2002 strip from the webcomic, Control alt delete depicting the destruction of a dial-up modem, albeit off-panel. Its sacrifice is symbolic of a changing era, from dial-up to streaming low-resolution video. As time passed, my dial-up connection would not suffice. Even as the internet community moved forward, I was stuck with slow speeds. I couldn't play online games. I couldn't watch videos. I don't think I ever tried Flash cartoons, but it wouldn't have gone well if I did. At the time, my house had a satellite subscription, and I watched a lot of G4 TV. In hindsight, a lot of gamery people were confused at the existence of G4 TV, a television channel for gaming, because anyone who wanted that kind of content could just go online and find so much to do with, but for a teenager like me that didn't have an adequate internet speed, it did the trick. I watched a lot of it. Most of the games I downloaded were small in size. I hung around the RPG Maker forums a lot, and although a lot of creators had the tendency of stuffing their games with loads of MP3 files and bloating their download sizes, sometimes creators would score their game with MIDI files, which meant a much more reasonable file size. Megabytes in the single digits. It was frustrating because I was a computery guy, and if you wanted to do computery things with other computery people, a decent internet connection was expected. Dial-up held me back from a lot of activities that I would have preferred, but other ways I managed. In fact, learning how to cope with dial-up would be a long learning experience until I was free from it. IRC was okay for my dial-up internet. It was an equalizer in a way. No one was posting pictures or videos through IRC, at least not directly. In terms of chat, I was getting information as fast as everyone else. The problem, of course, is when people did blink videos. Chances are I wouldn't even check to see what the video was about, or I'd ask which would confuse or annoy people. Moving into the mid to the late 2000s with the debut of YouTube and more video streaming services, I had to explain to a lot of people that I had dial a baronet and couldn't watch videos. At least not right away. To get around it, I got a video downloading program. That way I could grab the video like I would downloading a file off the internet, instead of streaming it directly from the site, which was scarcely successful. The videos were never that big, maybe 30 megabytes at max, depending on the length of the video. I was never a stickler for video quality, as you can imagine for obvious reasons. And after all, once I had the video, I had it forever. After being suggested to the Nostalgia Critic, I gained an interest in his videos. The video downloading programs did not work on that guy with the glasses site, so I was grateful whenever his fans uploaded his videos to YouTube because I could grab them there. Like a lot of nerds, I wanted to be a funny internet critic and honestly, I think I could have pulled it off. Thing is, I wasn't doing anything with dial-up, let alone no camera or mic, so that dream had to die. Not only did I use a special downloading program for videos, I also used a download manager called FlashGet to help me download bigger files and was always helpful if the source allowed pausing and resuming. Even with smaller files, it was helpful because if I was downloading something and if my internet screwed up, I wouldn't have to start all over again if the source allowed resuming of the download. When I want to read Let's Plays, which were never video Let's Plays, I would have to stop the page from loading and click on each individual image to load it manually because my internet could not handle loading dozens of images at once and would eventually just give up. I had a similar problem browsing places like 4chan, because if I opened a thread with loads of images, it would usually overload my internet and just quit. The worst of it, though, was trying to get my internet to work with a lot of modern games. Even back then, Steam was pretty much the norm. Some of you probably know this, but you can't even log into Steam without an adequate connection. Dial-up did not make the cut.
At the time, my friends were huge fans of Team Fortress 2 and Left 4 Dead, and I missed out on both of those games in their heyday. Steam was out of the question, and so was any other game that required me to download lots of install data. I became known as a retro gamer among my friends because I started emulating a lot of old games including DOS titles. During this time, I became familiar with the old Civilization and Elder Scrolls games, among others. One of my favorite games from this time was the original Age of Empires, which I downloaded a lot of custom content for, and played a lot of. Sometimes I would buy PC games at retail, like GTA 4. Grand Theft Auto 4 required a lot of online activation, which to someone with a dial-up connection was troublesome, but the good news is, is that logging into Games for Windows Live and setting up a Rockstar account did not take much time at all. Playing GTA 4 on the PC was surprisingly doable. Fallout 3 was also on Games for Windows Live, but I don't even remember having to log on for that one. I wasn't downloading any mods or patches, but all things considered, my FO3 experience was pretty breezy. Speaking of Fallout, I did try to download those games too, the originals. Despite being the better half of a gigabyte in size each, using FlashGet I was able to completely download them, albeit over the course of several days and weeks. They were worth it though, especially Fallout 2 which remains one of my favorite games to this day. I had a similar experience taking loads of time to download Deus Ex and Morrowind, but despite the trouble to get them, I didn't play too far into them. Talk about a waste. After getting a new computer, I purchased a retail version of Fallout New Vegas, but couldn't play it because it required access to a Steam account I couldn't give. Meanwhile, Bioshock installed correctly, and after a long update, ran without flaw. It was the same deal with StarCraft 2. After a long update, the game ran perfectly fine. Red Alert 3 installed correctly off of the retail disc, but I couldn't get any updates, which was a problem because the initial release had abysmal pathfinding and an update could have helped. My experience with Minecraft was extremely good all things considered. The install size wasn't that big, and if I remember correctly, the sounds and music could download while you play the game and they just pop in. Downloading and installing mods wasn't much of a problem either. All in all, I had a good Minecraft experience, although I wasn't watching a lot of videos and wasn't doing any multiplayer. I can't talk about Minecraft without talking about Terraria, which was another game I played a lot of during my time with dial-up internet. I got it off to Sura, remember that? Because I couldn't play it on Steam. But I played that game all throughout its growth, including the beta, and each time I would have to take a couple hours to download the update, but it was doable. Again, there wasn't any multiplayer, but I loved my time with it. I'm sure if I had Terraria on Steam all those versions and all those years ago, it would easily have the highest Steam clock on my account. You know, it was around this time that I first started listening to podcasts. At 30 megs on average, they took a little while to download but provided hours of entertainment. Although even back then I didn't listen to a lot of podcasts, my scope was very narrow. Which is a shame because thinking of all the great podcasts I listen to now that have been around for years, I could have gotten in early and had a really good time. I read a lot of webcomics, but Homestuck, with its GIF animations and Flash segments, took a while to binge through. Some of those GIFs might have been only a half second long, but they probably took 10 minutes to load. Doubly so for Flash segments. I put up with it because in the end, I adored Homestuck, at least for a little while. Once the story introduced its second batch of trolls, my fervor was dwindling and soon the inconvenience of trying to watch flash animation with a dial-up connection did not make up for the story content. What about my console gaming? For years, I was using a PS2 and a DS Lite. I was playing those games for a long time. It was about 2011 when I finally got a PS3. Online gaming was a huge part of the PS3, but I wasn't doing anything like that. This was the era of the day one patch, but for the most part, the games I bought worked. Fallout New Vegas for the PS3 was glitchy, but even after the official patch it was still glitchy, so it's not like it would have mattered. Buying Bethesda games for consoles was a subpar experience, but what other choice did I have? Playing games offline wasn't too bad. Obviously with the Souls games I was missing out on a huge part of the experience. Yes, I played Demon Souls, Dark Souls, and Dark Souls 2 in the dark so to speak. No invasions, no summoning, but most importantly, no player messages. I miss out on a lot of hints. 
In some cases, I re-bought games because Deluxe Editions had DLC that I couldn't get off the internet. You don't need to tell me that's a waste of money, but I was desperate. Now, in early 2013, I upgraded to that subpar wireless I was talking about, but it didn't make much of a difference. It didn't work with my PS3, and since they're probably wondering, how fast was that low-grade wireless? Yep. It took me a little too long to get on board for GOG.com. I only started using it when my best friend gifted me The Witcher, which I downloaded at my brother's house through mobile phone and brought it home where I transferred the installation to my computer. I should have climbed aboard a long time ago because of all the smaller and mostly cheap games that you can find on there. Thinking back to 2013, that's when I realized that I wanted to make video games. I had no idea where to start. I made the mistake of trying to learn a programming language instead of just diving into a game creation software like GameMaker or something. To be honest, it wasn't bad trying to learn programming with a dial-up connection, but most help came in the form of videos. Videos that took a long time to download and I had no guarantee if they even helped me with my problem until I actually got to watch the video. So, to reiterate, I first got internet in 1999 and had dial-up internet or comparable wireless until 2014. 15 years and I should say that some of those years I didn't have internet at all, which you can imagine was even worse than super slow speeds. But eventually I got out. Eventually, I was free. When I moved into the city and got wireless, Steam was finally on the table, but it took a couple weeks for me to get my computer up and running, so in the meantime I started listening to a lot of podcasts after getting recommendations from some friends. Around the time I moved, Shadowrun Dragonfall was getting a lot of attention, so my first Steam purchase was Shadowrun Returns. It wasn't long after that that I purchased Dust and Elysian Tail, since I had wanted to play it for a long time, ever since I first learned about it. At last, I could play online games with friends, I could watch videos, it was everything I wanted all those years. Fast forward to now where I've all but gotten use of those things. Nowadays, my complaint is I don't have a fast enough connection to watch video game streams consistently, and especially not host one. Did having dial-up all those years do anything for me, like grow my patience? I don't know, maybe. At the very least, it makes me sympathetic to those that still don't have great internet. Sometimes I read articles about game developers in places like Cuba and the lengths that they have to go to develop their games without good internet. I know some Vietnamese men that had similar experiences to me. Downloading and playing older and smaller video games exclusively because they could not get good internet where they lived. It makes me think about download sizes. Nowadays, even retro-looking games can have download sizes in the gigabytes, but that's usually because the game holds lots of uncompressed music files, and in the case of Lisa the Painful RPG, every kilobyte of that soundtrack is pure gold. Still, it's something that too many devs don't think about when still so many people have to think about subpar internet speeds and download limits. Speaking of music, when I had dial-up, I downloaded music like other people, but rarely sought new stuff out because of how long it took just to sample a simple song. Once I got wireless, I was going through music at an accelerated rate, but it was only until last year that I truly changed the nature of my musical exploration. I'm always listening to new stuff nowadays, and my listening tendencies have become more album-focused than ever, compared to a couple years ago and beforehand, when I listened to single songs and mixed playlists for the most part. Not much else to say. I'm sure in the future I'll get even better internet so I can stream consistently, but until then I can manage. I'll hold on to my memories of dial-up and be grateful that I had the ability to download games like... <laughs> well, pretty much the stuff I was playing while I was on dial-up, but at least now, it doesn't take weeks to download. <laughs>